We've been in this series for seven weeks. Today's the last Sunday, and I hope that you've learned something from what it means to trust in the Lord. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a greater thing. I, I know there's no greater thing in all of life that we can come to the place and time that we know Jehovah God as our Father, bless the Lord, as we learn Jesus as our Savior, as we learn that the Holy Spirit is there to, to lead us and guide us and be the leader in our wisdom, uh, there's, there's nothing greater than that. But if you're wise enough to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, the one thing you're going to need to learn is what it means to trust Him. If you trust Him enough to be your Savior, if you trust Him enough to put your eternity into His hands, if you know that the God who can do all things can take care of you, then we need to allow Him and let Him. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is what it means to wait on Him. How many of y'all like to wait? How many of you, one of your greatest hours of your week is that time that you go to Walmart and wait and wait? Or, or you hit 10 traffic lights in a row and they all make you wait. How many of y'all just love that, all right? Or, or you, you cook and then they, they tell you it's going to be 45 minutes. So you go back in 45 minutes and then my wife comes back and says, it's going to be a little longer. Right? Y'all ever had those circumstances in life? They're, what is it they say about the military? They, they teach you to hurry up and wait. And, and oh, I got some amens on that one there. Some veterans in the house. I, none of us really like to wait. But we've got to. And if we don't wait, there are consequences that come with that. And we need for our own betterment and our own good... If we say that we trust in God, now you might have troubles waiting on me, but you can wait on God. But yet in the circumstances, you don't want to have to do that. So today we're going to learn what it means to wait on God. Now, I'm going to do you a favor. I usually have you stand in honor of reading God's Word. But if it's okay with you, I'm going to, I'm going to cover the entire 37th chapter of Psalms today. So we're going we're gonna to look at it, and, and I don't, I don't want to make you stand for that, but I'm going to ask you to stand in my prayer in just a second. But before I do, I want you to listen when we're reading through Psalms 37. And there's a word that you're going to hear over and over and over and over again. It's the word shall. It's a tense of being. It means he said this shall be. That means that it's going to happen. Listen to me now. It's a certainty. It's a certainty. And as David wrote this at the end of his life, after he was older, and he's looking back on all the times that he found God faithful and all the times that he learned what it means to trust in God, he also learned that he could not get ahead of God. He had to wait on Him. But if you do wait on Him, there's some things that God said I will do. It shall happen. Now, as we, I'm going to pray, and as, we're going to read Psalms 37, and I want you to hear it echoed in your heart over and over again. Every time you hear this word shall, just understand God's got this. He's in control. He doesn't need your help. He just needs your trust. All right? So stand with me in honor of prayer as we will go to our Father. Let's pray. Now, Lord, this has been a busy week and we've done so much this week, but now we've, we've parted the seas of our week and we've come in here. We need our oasis. We need our Jesus time. We need the worship time. We need time in the Word. We need You to speak. And Lord, we have friends here and we love them. And Lord, we're grateful for the work of the church. But Lord, this is a time when we need to hear Your teaching. Your, we need to hear Your Spirit's leadership in our life. And if we do hear with the eyes of our heart, we will be blessed. If we don't, it'll be a waste of time. Lord, it's never a waste of time to be with You. 
So Lord, I pray that you speak. Give us ears to hear, a heart that is open. And Lord, as you speak, let it be amen in our spirit. Draw us close. Jesus, we ask that you do an eternal work in time that we'll, we can carry with us forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Psalms 37, we're going to begin in verse number one. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord. And by the way, and if you do, do good. Dwell in the land. Settle down. Feed on His faithfulness. God's got plans for you. Delight yourself in the Lord. and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way. Roll those burdens over upon Him. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. And He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait. Oh, but he says, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. Stop it. Forsake wrath. You don't need to. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. I want you to hear again also the word shall, but the word inherit. You're going to hear it again. For yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him. He sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart. Their bows shall be broken. It's going to happen. It's a certainty. Verse 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arm of the wicked shall be broken. The Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright. I love that part of that, that verse. That did just give you a great pause and very great contentment in your soul to know that the Almighty God who watches over, who listens, who knows your days, He knows the days of you who are seeking to do upright. And their, their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. The enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the, of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke, they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay. The righteous shows mercy and gives. And those blessed by him shall inherit the earth. And God's creation, God created all this earth. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, Psalms 24, 1. But he wants us to know that this was his blessed for us. This is not to punish us, but it's to help us. We need to understand that he will come through for us. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. I love verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, and we will, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Verse 25. I have been young, now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful, and he lends, and his descendants are blessed. 
Depart from evil and do good. Dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. The descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches over the righteousness and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Here's where we are, verse 34. Wait. Dear lover of God, wait. But don't just wait without a cause. Wait on the Lord. Keep His way. And He shall inherit you. Excuse me. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away. Behold, he was no more. Indeed, I saw him, but he could not be found. But mark the blameless man. Observe the righteous. For the future of that man is peace. The transgressors shall be destroyed uh, together. But the future of the righteous shall be cut off. Excuse me, the future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Oh, verse 40. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. Did you hear that? Did y'all notice that word shall in there? Did any of you count how many times it was there? Over how many? 37 times in chapter 37. Oh my goodness. Inherit the land. God has promises that are there. He says this is is true. You can count on it. The God who has all power in His hand will not let you down. But notice the time frame. It shall come about. It's not here yet. Of a certainty it's coming, but you're going to have to wait on it. The Almighty God that is eternal, He's not affected by time. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing's going to change Him. Nothing's going to upset His ways. God is always at work, listen to me now, but He works on His schedule. How many of you know God's never late? But how many of you know He's never early either? Don't you wish you could hurry Him up every now and again? But He's on schedule. His timing, it's important. And it's important for us to learn. It's important that we learn to trust in Him so that we can live in the joy of His will. I I was thinking about this, and I was thinking in in the life of David as he learned this very valuable lesson of what it meant to trust in God and not to get ahead of God. I was thinking about of his predecessor. David knew this story. King Saul was the first king of Israel. And when he was facing his first major battle, he, he, he was... The Philistines were coming against him. 30,000 chariots, all these horses, and the people, uh, soldiers like the sand. That means that they saw them. They they said that they couldn't even think about counting them. There were so many. I guess as far as they could see, they could see soldiers. And when this happened, the people of Israel, the, the, the Saul called them to battle, but they were scared and they began to run. In 1 Samuel 13, this is what God's Word says. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed, then the people hid themselves in caves, in thickets. Well, that's a, not a fun place to hide yourself in a thicket. In rocks, in holes, and in pits. You can tell they're scared. Some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gilead, and the, all the people followed him. Look at this word, trembling, crying out to God. Oh Lord, what, what are you going to do? All this vast army, they're, they're, they're afraid, but they're having to face it. Then in verse 8, then, then he, that is Saul, waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, the prophet. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul's waiting. Samuel said, I'll come and I'll, I'll, I'll bring the offering. I'll do the offering. 
Don't go to battle until I give you the offering, but, but just wait on me. It'll be seven. I'll come within seven days. And seven days had come. Saul waiting. Now seven days had passed. So look what verse 9 says. So Saul said, bring a bird offering and peace offerings here to me. And when they did, it says in verse 9, he offered the burnt offerings. Wasn't his job. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't of, the, uh, uh, of that line. He wasn't of the Levites. It wasn't his place. He had no right. But he did it anyway. Verse 10. Now what happened as soon as he had finished presenting the bird offering that Samuel came. Isn't that funny? We, we can't wait, we can't wait, we can't wait, and we do it. And then we, after we do it, when we weren't supposed to, then Samuel shows up. I mean, right then, as soon as he had finished, Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. Verse 11, Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, You know, you always have an excuse why we do the things that we do. Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the, the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Mishmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled. I felt like it was the right thing to do. I waited. You weren't here. It needed to be done. I felt it was the right thing to do. You hear me? Instead of waiting on God, instead of trusting in God, Saul took matters into his own hands. I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. And by the way, it didn't. It didn't. Saul's land, his line ended at that moment. And they died. And as they died off, it was gone. God said, I would have made you the line that I would have brought the great Messiah through, but you would not trust in me. And when it became difficult, you would not wait upon me. Church, how often, I wonder, we get on the verge of a miracle. We take matters in our own hands. We get ahead of God. And we live with the consequences. I dare say every one of us have done this. And I dare say that we probably can look back upon those times when we got ahead and we messed it up and we look back with wisdom and we say, I should not have. But at that time when we were there, we weren't waiting, we weren't trusting. We, we, can, we, we can be grieved by that now. And we think, oh, how things could have been different. And instead of just living in the regret of those missed opportunities, giving up on the verge of a miracle, I wonder if we could learn from that lesson today. We've, we've gone over these things for seven weeks that God is crying out to us, you know me, you can trust me, I'll be the delight of your life. You can take those, those burdens, you can commit your way unto me. Rest. Find peace with me. I want you to have rest. But wait on me. Wait on me. If you step ahead of God and do you not wait on God's perfect timing, it brings more difficulty and anxiety than you could ever understand. This word wait is a unique word. It means to look for, to hope. To live with expectancy. But I looked a little deeper into this word. In the, in the, in, 
in the, in the root of this word, it says that it means to bind together, to collect. And it really uses the word to twist. You take some things together and you bind them together. You twist them together. How many of you know if you have one string, it can snap? But if you took a lot of them and you strung them together, the strength would be there together. There are a lot of times that, that we understand that, that, that we, we, may, we may be looking at the answer in this one little string, but if we, can, if we can wrap them together with the faithfulness of God and how we've seen the faithfulness of God, are you listening, church? And how God comes through in His time. And it may not seem like He's going to, but He always comes through. And He always does that which is right. And we learn that Romans 8.28 is true. All things do work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And, and it's actually the root word there is the same word that's, that's, that's about a, a spider's thread. That He comes and He makes the web. And He makes the web and then He has to, he can't do anything else except wait. I wonder if we could take this experiences of life and the, and the goodness of God that we've seen and bind them together. And, and wouldn't it be great if we would know that, that God is at work, that God is watching over us, that God will take care of us. He's praying for us. We don't have to help Him out. We can just wait on Him. What about old Abraham? God met him down at the earth of the Chaldees, and God said, I'm going to make of you a mighty nation. I'm going to take you, Abraham. You'll be the father of a mighty nation. Leave this place. And Abraham had enough belief in God and trust in him to follow him out. And he made it to the promised land. And then he, when, when things got hard, he took matters into his own hand, and God had said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. And then old Abe got 90 years old. And God still said, I'm going to make of you a mighty nation. How many of you know to, have, make, to make a tribe, you're going to have to have children and grandchildren. Can I get an amen? I mean, that's how you, you have to have a heritage. You have to have, listen to me now, an inheritance. Right? And I don't know too, 90, too many 90-year-old men that are saying, uh, yeah, it's going to happen any day now. And then Sarah, his wife, said, uh, hey, Abe, I got a, I got a plan. I, I'm, I'm not able to give you a child, but my, my handmaiden, Hagar, hold on, Paul's right there. I mean, they should, Abraham should have known something was wrong when his wife was offering him a woman by the name of Hagar. Hagar, no. If you ever meet somebody and he's going to marry a woman by the name of Hagar, send him to me, I'll do marriage counseling. It'll save him from a lot of Misery and strife, right? Lord knows somebody was going to watch this video and they're going to call and say, I know a woman by the name of Hagar. But they, they, they came up with a plan. And by the way, it made sense to them. And Abraham went in with Hagar and she had child and his name was Ishmael. By the way, Ishmael was a father of a great nation too, the Arab nation. All the Arabs came from the line of Abraham through his son, Ishmael. Ten years later, a hundred years old, God came through for Abraham and he had a son, a son by the name of Isaac. And he made of him a mighty nation, the Jewish nation of which Jesus came from that line. The Messiah God came through that line. But let me ask you, have the Jews and the Arabs, have they ever had a battle, a disagreement? Do they like each other? I wonder what it would have been like if Abraham had waited on the faithfulness of God. But he got ahead of him. You see, our problem is, is we want God to work on our schedule and we don't like it when there seems to be a delay. In our society, when we want everything and we want it now. We don't like it when God makes us wait. 
Yet when we look at God's timing and we see the delay, sometimes we think, I hope you are ready to hear this, sometimes we think that God's delay may be negligence on His behalf. And we blame God like Saul blamed Samuel. You weren't here for seven days. I felt like it was the right thing to do. Abraham, God, I was 90 years old. My wife couldn't have a child. We had to do something. I, helped, I was trying to help you out. Surely we can learn from this, couldn't we? Can we learn from the life of Jesus? You ever heard it when Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. So when Jesus said that, in the circumstances, as a matter of fact, one time they were about to take him and throw him off a cliff. But he didn't fret that. He didn't worry about that. He wasn't anxious about that. He wasn't worried about the plans of God. God took care of him that day. God took care of him every day. Because he knew his hour had not yet come, he didn't worry about all those other things. He left him in the very capable of hand of God. But when it was the right time, and Jesus actually had spent all the, the, the time up there on the mountain, and God began to say to him, okay, it's coming. Then he would say, my hour is come. Galatians 4 said, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. You're never going to get ahead of the hour of God, the coming of God, the blessing of God. I want to tell you two quick stories from the life of Jesus that maybe we can learn from. First one's from Mark chapter 5. There was this man by the name of uh, Jairus, and, and he had a daughter that was sick. Now, if, if you had a child that was sick, and you would want what's best for that child. And he had heard that Jesus could heal. So he was willing to go to Jesus and maybe he could convince Jesus to come to his house and heal his daughter. So he went to Jesus and he told them the circumstance and Jesus said, I'll come. And he went with Jairus and there, as they were traveling to Jairus' house and all those people that were around him, they met a woman along the way. Now, we don't know much about the woman. We don't know her name. But the Bible says that she had an issue of blood. And she had had it for some time. And you and I both know that when you lose blood, you, you're weak. And, and, and when, when those things are happening, she, she was probably pale. And she probably had no energy. But she just knew if she could just get to Jesus. If she could just get to Jesus. And most likely, she said, if I could just touch him. And, and, and she was probably on her hands and knees pushing through the crowd when Jesus came by and she reached out just to touch the hem of his garment. And as she probably lunged out and touched the hem of his garment, Immediately, she was healed. And that pale face probably became bright and rosy red. And the energy came back within her. And where she probably felt like she had no energy, she probably could stand up and take a good deep breath and a sigh. Oh, Y'all like those sighs? I love those sighs of peace when the Lord brings them upon you, right? And Jesus just stopped. Who touched me? The disciples are saying, what do you mean who touched you? All these people are out here and they're pushing in on us. Everybody wants to touch you. Everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody wants to see you. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I felt power leaving me. Who touched me? I wonder what it was like when her eyes met his. And you know he smiled. That probably gave her great comfort and warmth and she probably smiled back and said, Lord, it was me. And she begins to tell their story. Jesus always has time for a miracle. Jesus always has time to minister to somebody along the way. He's never in such a hurry. Are you ever in a hurry? Don't you know Jairus was in a hurry? I mean, he was probably over there patting his foot. 
This is good. That's fine. She's good. Let's go. My daughter's sick. She's dying. Don't you know his heart had to be beating? But then Jairus' servants walk up and say, it's too late. She's gone. She's dead. She's gone. I wonder what was going through old dad's mind and heart. If only I had gotten to him quicker. If only we could have gotten home quicker. I've just witnessed healing. This woman is healed by this man. If I could have just got him there quicker. But now it's too late. Jesus just said, have faith. All things are possible. Oh, come on. And they begin the journey on to Jairus' house. I wonder what was going through Jairus' mind. And when they get there, to hear the, the singers of the mourners, the sound of them there. And he, his heart probably sunk within him. But Jesus said, get away. She's, she's just asleep. And they went up in the upper room and the dad saw his lifeless daughter there. Come on now. But then he saw Jesus take her by the hand and say, arise. And there is no barrier to the power of God when God's, in a, when God's ready to heal. When God's ready to do what He comes to do. She was lifted up went and hugged her mom and dad. And oh my goodness, didn't she have a story to tell at school the next week? Wait on the Lord. Have y'all ever heard of this guy by the name of Lazarus? Lived in Bethany, had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus got sick and Mary and Martha sent and said, go get Jesus. We know he's the man who can heal. And when they, the, the servants got to, to where Jesus was, they told him what was happening. And Jesus, here it's now, he tarried. He delayed. He didn't jump up and go with them and say, oh, we need to hurry. He waited. And later, days, he says, come on, let's go. But he already knew that Lazarus was dead. And by the way, when he got there, Martha came to him and said, if you had been here, where were you? The servants came back and they said, you said it wasn't unto death, but he's dead. By the way, Martha said the same thing when she went out to, excuse me, Mary said the same thing. If you had been here, See, what they didn't understand was Jesus wasn't there just to bring a healing. He had done that before. He was going to do another work. You see, now when Lazarus died, they prepared his body and they put him in the tomb and they rolled the stone over the tomb and days went by. Exactly what would happen to him, Jesus when he would die and they would prepare the body and take it to the tomb and they would roll the stone over the tomb and days would pass. He was giving them a glimpse of what was coming. And they were waiting. But they didn't understand God's delay. We need to learn to trust in the Lord. We need to learn to trust in the ways of God. We need to know in our spirit that God cannot mess up. He cannot make a mistake. He will always come through for you. It shall happen. You will inherit. God loves you with an everlasting love. And yet in the midst of the things that we go through, We put a question mark over God. By the way, we do this in many ways of our life. Like Saul, we think within ourselves and 
when things don't come up the way that we want them, then everything else is wrong because they're not done the way I think is right. Mary and Martha felt that way. Jairus had to feel that way. But God orchestrated in them that they would have to wait. Why, why is it that sometimes we have to wait so long that it seems like we're past hope when hope walks in? I mean, we are so very desperate. And I wonder how often we give up on the verge of a miracle. We're counted out. We're done. We walk away from the will and the power and the love of God and the joy and the peace that can come from that. I mean, if He's God, and He is, then He can handle it. And if He's God and He knows what's best, He can make it happen. And He can protect you along the way. And though you might not like His timing, His timing is sanctified as well. It's perfect. It's perfect. I'm going to give you a personal story. I didn't tell this in the first service. Um, I don't know that you've heard this story. You may have heard me tell this story before, but when I was 16, I was 17, I was deeply in love. And uh, it didn't work, as it often doesn't work when you're 17. And uh, by the way, I'm extremely grateful that um, I didn't marry that girl. You don't need to know the rest of the story, but you can probably guess. And I was so distraught, and I asked God, I said, Lord, I thought she was the one. I was sure she was the one. And I said, if she's not the one, give me her name. Tell me who I'm going to marry. And a name came upon my mind, Lynn Johnson. I thought, I don't know Lynn Johnson. I knew Lynn Shirley. She was a majorette and she was cute. I knew Nan Johnson. She lived about a block away and she was mighty cute too. And I thought, but I don't know Lynn Johnson. But I married Lynn Johnson. Nine years later, yesterday morning, we were sitting on the couch and she looked over at me. She had her Bible in her hand. I had my Bible in my hands. She looked at me and she said, this is what I prayed for. I said, what? She said, I, I prayed that God would bring me a godly man that we could live a life together serving the Lord who loved God more than me. and He loved me more than I could understand. And I told her, I said, I do. She had opportunities to get married. She knew a guy was going to propose to her. But she had a dream. God told her, he said, don't marry him. He's not the one. Wait. And as he was ready to propose, she said, don't do it. Don't do it. Her mom got mad at her. Her grandmother said she was going to be dancing in the pig trough. I'm not sure what that means, but she meant something by it. Her mom actually was going to kick her out because she wasn't going to marry this guy, doctor's son. And yet, she looked over at me yesterday and she said, I'm so glad I waited on the Lord. This is what I prayed for. By the way, I'm very glad she waited too. And I wasn't going around trying to find somebody named Lynn Johnson that I could marry. Matter of fact, I didn't even think about it until after we'd been married. She came walking down the stairs of our townhouse and God's like, you remember that day over in Ridgeley Circle? And you prayed and I told you who you're going to marry? And I'd, oh yeah, I remember. He said, that's her. 
we were already married before I re he reminded me of it. You can wait. It might be long. For Abraham, he was 100. If he can wait till he's 100 to have a baby, you can wait. Jesus, before he created the earth, before he put life upon this earth, he knew the cross of Calvary was awaiting him. He knew that an hour was coming that he would come and be the sin payment for my sins and your sins. And he waited faithfully along the way. Now let me tell you the one time you don't need to wait. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of God, you don't have a choice. You have to wait. But if you've never made the decision to give your heart and life to Christ, become a follower of Christ, to turn from your sins and your way of life and give your life to Him, you don't need to wait. You're hanging by a thread. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I have to tell you the truth. You're one heartbeat from being separated from God forever. And you say, well, I'm, I'm waiting for a more convenient time. There is no more convenient time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Well, I'm waiting for this to happen and this to happen. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. That ambulance might be yours. Trust in the Lord. Trust Him enough to save you. And if you trust Him enough to save you, then know that He'll keep you.